And welcome to our live broadcast at First Presbyterian Church. It is a joy to come into your home today with good news about God who loves you. We are located in beautiful Uptown Columbus on the corner of 11th and 1st. We would love for you to join us for worship or just stop by and say hello. At First Presbyterian Church, we welcome you with grace and gratitude for God's love. Good morning. morning. Invite those who are able to please stand for our call to worship. We will be called in a responsive, with a response that's used throughout this world today. Many places they have said it. Many places have yet to say it. I will say Christ is risen, and you respond, He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Let us worship God.
please be seated. Scripture reminds us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And yet at the right time, Christ died for us. So let us confess our sins without fear, but with sorrow, let us pray. Wonderful Lord, in raising Jesus from the grave, you shattered the power of sin and death. You provide the path for new life for that which will be and that which is now. Yet all too often we remain captive to fear and doubt, anxiety and confusion. We overlook the needs of the world that are before us. And we are inattentive to the care of our souls. We are indifferent to your love for us. Yet you call us by name. You have given us the possibility of hope. Your love never ends. On this Easter day, transform us by the power of your new life that gives us new life. Scripture also reminds us that anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Friends, hear and believe the good news of the gospel. Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Please be seated. Hello, everyone. Come on down, you guys. It's so exciting to see all of our visitors and our new faces today. It's wonderful to have you with us. Well, those of you who are visiting don't know this, but last week I shared with the kids a special little something. Do you all remember what it was? Hey, Alexander. It was a little brown, sort of dirty, crusty sort of a thing that looked a little bit like an onion. Do you all remember that? What was it, Tripp? It was a bulb, it was a seed, exactly. And I told you guys that when you come to church today, that the whole church will be full of what this seed was. Do you guys know what it is? Exactly, look around, they're everywhere. Well, the one that I actually, now I have the bulbs at home and I'm trying to make them grow, but I've learned over my lifetime, I'm not very good at growing anything except kids. So I bought this one so that you could see what our lilies are going to look like they're actually going to be pink. And these are special oriental lilies. They're called stargazers. Aren't they gorgeous? We're gonna take them upstairs with us today so we can take a good, long, close look at them. But I was researching, what does the lily mean? Why do we have lilies at Easter? And what it means is that it's the, it's the beauty of the new life of the resurrection. It's Jesus being reborn, right? So we have these beautiful lilies. And in the scripture, it says, consider the lilies of the field, for even Solomon, dressed in all of his royal robes, have not the worth of them. Now, what that means is that even the most beautiful riches in the whole wide world have nothing compared to these lilies. God loves all the little things. He loves every breath of wind. He loves every butterfly. I want to share with you guys a little something because 
uh, many, many years ago, maybe not too many, but I sat on a rainy day in my house and I prayed and prayed and prayed for God to send me a daughter. Well, he sent me my beautiful Anne Marie and she was born and then eight short months later, God surprised me with another little girl. A big surprise. So that little girl was due on Easter day almost exactly 18 years ago. Can you guess who that was? Who was it? You know who it was. Say it. It was my Easter Lily, exactly. She was due on Easter day, so I named her Lily. Now, she's about to be 18 years old, and I have watched her be a ballerina and a soccer player and a volleyball player, and I've watched her blossom and grow into this beautiful young lady that you see right here who's about to be an official adult. And in just a few short months, she'll be going off to college. And it seemed like it happened that fast, very quickly. So I want you guys in your life to think about every single breath of wind and every single butterfly and every single warm hug from your mommy and cherish that because those are the things that God values. That is the rebirth and that is what life is all about. So remember that, okay? All right, we're going to go upstairs and we're going to talk a little bit more about this and what a glorious day it is that we get to celebrate. This is the most important day in our whole entire year. <laughs> thank you, Liza. I agree. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your sacrifice of sending your son to us. Lord, we can't thank you enough and we can't say enough. We just praise you and we honor you today and we thank you for the glory of new life and for lilies, big and small. Lord, we thank you for every blessing of this life that you've given us, the tiniest, tiniest ones. And Lord, we ask that you will help us to recognize those when they come our way and not to overlook them. Lord, I thank you so much for these children and these families. Lord, as they come to us today, I ask that they will be blessed and they will learn more about you. And Lord Jesus, I just, as they're traveling home this afternoon or whenever they're leaving, Lord, I ask travel mercies over them that they will arrive home safely to begin their week. Lord, I thank you for all the many blessings of this life, especially my family and this church. In Christ's name, amen. Let's go. Again, send uh, greetings to you all this morning. So glad you're with us. For those that are gathered here, I ask that you sign the attendance pad. It's the end of your pew, and then pass it back to the point of origin. And be sure to extend uh, that right hand of fellowship following the worship service. I want to greet those who are worshiping with us today at Spring Harbor at the church that is gathered there. Some of you all are watching us uh, from your home, uh, from your uh, hospital room. Uh, some of you are from out of town. For whatever reason, you're watching us in your hotel room. Uh, there are those who are watching us across the river and across the country. Once again, happy Easter to Oregon. And those who are watching us across the shores as well. All are welcomed here on this day of worship. There are several announcements in the bulletin. I commend them to you as we look at the events in the week that follow. Just a special note that today we will later receive the Easter offering, one great hour of sharing. Part of it will go to the global mission offering of this church. The other part will go to the Presbyterian Disaster Assistance Fund. That's how we divide it, uh, but that's where um, any unmarked offering as well as those for Easter will go towards that. Now let us continue our worship as we prepare to hear God's Word read and proclaimed. Invite all who are able to please stand for our hymn for illumination.
Our first lesson today comes from Isaiah's prophecy, chapter 65, starting in verse 17. Listen now to the Word of God. For I am about to create new heavens and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I am creating. For I am about to create Jerusalem as a joy and its people as a delight. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and delight in my people. No more shall the sound of weeping be heard in it, nor the cry of distress. No more shall there be in it an infant that lives but a few days, or an old person who does not live out a lifetime. For one who dies at a hundred years will be considered a youth, and the one who falls short of a hundred will be considered accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be, and my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity, for they shall be offspring blessed by the Lord and their descendants as well. Before they call, I will answer, and while they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, the lion shall eat straw like the ox. But the serpent, its food shall be dust, and they shall not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, says the Lord. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. I invite you to stand as you are able in body and in spirit that we might hear the scripture, the story of the resurrection as recounted in the Gospel of John. Let us listen that we may hear what God may be saying to us this day. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. She ran and went to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, 
and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and he went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as they had not yet did not understand the Scripture, that Jesus must rise from the dead, then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stayed and stood outside, weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over and looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she said this, she turned and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus looked at her and said, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said, Sir, they have carried him away. Tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. risen Christ is risen. risen Happy Easter. Happy Easter. It is good to be here. It is good to be able to say with conviction and hope, Christ is risen. The difficulty of Good Friday the waiting of Holy Saturday is past. It is Easter Sunday, and we are here to worship God, to give thanks for the power of resurrection, the, the hope of new life. I'm aware that every one of us, for a whole variety of reasons, are here today. Some of those reasons we state and we celebrate, and some of those reasons maybe more in the interior of our being. Maybe we can't even quite put them into words. We're looking for something, but not sure what. I invite you to finish this sentence. You don't have to do this out loud, of course, but finish this sentence. I came to church this morning because some of those reasons that we would state might be that because it is Easter. I came to church this morning to hear the music and the hallelujah chorus. I came to church this morning because I was asked. But then there are those reasons that are rattling around inside of us, unformed or maybe even more formed than we want to, but we don't want to say. I came to church this morning because it was expected. I came to church this morning because I had better not show up at the family luncheon without having gone to church first. I came to church this morning because. You fill in those blanks. Maybe, like Mary in the gospel story this morning, we came this morning because we were looking for something. But what is it? What is it? 
Each one of the four Gospels in the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're the, the books that tell us about Jesus' life. In each one of those, there are different variations on this particular account. What happens to Jesus in his trial and, and, and crucifixion and resurrection? And in John's account, as in all the others, Jesus is risen. Jesus is not there. The stone is removed and is rolled away. The tomb is open. But there are differences in details. There's an old saying that where there are two Presbyterians, there are at least three opinions. And I think that's probably true of the gospel writers as well. And maybe it's not that Maybe there's more to it that we are more like them than we, want, we might want to admit. We get that stuff honestly and naturally. The common interpretation is that Mary went to the tomb to attend to the body of Christ. It had been hurriedly taken down on Friday when Christ was executed, when he was crucified and he was dead. He needed to be put, the body needed to be taken care of and put away, and there was not enough time to properly prepare it for burial. The Sabbath came, no actions could be taken. So early on that third day, that Sunday morning, that Easter morning, they, were eight, they then went and were going to prepare the body. John's Gospel, though, says it a little bit differently. And in the verses right before where I began reading in John 19, that gospel writer says, they, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, took the body of Jesus and they wrapped it and they put spices on it and linen cloths according to the burial customs of the Jews. John's gospel doesn't say why Mary went, just that she did. And that is congruent with all of the other accounts of the Gospels. Mary went. I'd like to think that she went to be a witness, that she went to bear testimony to the relationship, the way in which Jesus had interacted in her life as her master and her teacher, as a friend, the way in which she had known him, and come to see and live in the world differently because of him. She went to stand by his grave, as it were, to stand by the tomb as a sentinel. But when she got there, something was different and amiss, something that wasn't expected. The stone that had been used to seal the tomb was gone. It was removed. It wasn't there. When a body is buried, the tomb is sealed. When we go to the cemetery and we conduct a, a ceremony, we seal the tomb. We seal the casket. It is buried and gone and out of sight. But the seal was gone. The stone was gone. It had been removed. And Mary is there as a witness. It is notable that Mary went because John tells us others did not. She was the only one. And when she sees this, she runs back to the other disciples and she, she tells Peter and one of the others the one John calls the one that Jesus loved, she tells them something's wrong, something's amiss. The, the stone is gone. The tomb is open. Throughout John's gospel, there is a tension between Peter and this other disciple that Jesus loved. Can you get at it? There's a little bit of picking at it. There's the Peter and the one that Jesus loved. You're Peter, and I'm the one that Jesus loved. I have to think that there is some, some competition going on there. And maybe this is a way of seeing how the early church heard 
the story of Jesus and the power of the resurrection. Some of them heard it through Peter. And they heard Peter's testimony. And they heard those people that Peter nourished. And then this other disciple, the one identified as the one who Jesus loves, people heard the story through him as well. There is this conflict going back and forth. And when Mary gets to them, to these two disciples, and she says, the stone is gone. I don't know where they put him. What are we going to do? They both head out to that tomb. They want to see it. And they even race. They foot race. They run to see who's going to get there first. Even the sense of competition in that point is getting is being shared with us. Can you imagine two of Jesus' disciples in competition to get there first? That competition is real. John describes the Last Supper as one where the, the, the disciple that Jesus loved sat next to Jesus and not Peter. And the disciple that Jesus loved stood at the foot of the cross along with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Mary Magdalene and Clopas. But Peter wasn't there. And the disciple that Jesus loved raced Peter to the tomb, and he got there first. A little bit of competition going on. But then at the tomb... He lets Peter go in first to see what is there. Have you ever felt in competition with a brother or sister in Christ? Have you ever had a, a conflict or a controversy with somebody or a, a, even a good argument? Well, you know, the mode of baptism is really important, and you have to be immersed or you have to be sprinkled. Or when we celebrate communion and we celebrate the Last Supper, Jesus' blood and body are really there. That's what we're taking part in. Or no, it's just a memorial. It's just something that we do. Or maybe even you have to say what you believe by using a particular set of words, a particular formula or you're not saved. Have you ever had that kind of conflict? In reality, we're not that far removed in the church from those conflicts of Peter and the disciple that Jesus loved. And those conflicts can turn nasty and can turn into fights. It can get personal and even ugly. But Peter and the disciple that Jesus loved were there together, brought together at the power, by the power of Easter. They were there at the tomb. They weren't there at the cross. They were there at the tomb where the stone was removed, where the way of entering the world by God's power was given new meaning. They saw. They saw that the tomb was empty, and they believed. And John's gospel tells us pretty clearly they saw and they believed, but they didn't quite understand. They didn't quite comprehend, at least, at least not yet. And then they left. But Mary, Mary stays. Mary Magdalene stays, and she sees two angels, and then she sees another figure. She's so distraught, she's weeping. Her vision must be clouded. They ask her why she is weeping. She says, they've taken my Lord. Where is he? And then a voice calls her name. And by calling her name, all those other things are removed. 
the uncertainty, the challenge, the pain, it is cut through as Jesus, the risen Lord, calls her name. Something happens. The stone has been removed. Life is now different. Mary wants to grab hold of Jesus. You get the image, I think, of wanting to grab his feet and hold on to him. But he says, no, not yet. There's, there's more to do. Throughout John's gospel, Jesus keeps saying to the disciples and to all of the people there, I will be returning to God, my Father and your Father. I'm going to be returning and preparing a way for you. And this is simply part of that preparation. So let me get on with it. Don't hold on to me because you have to hold on to each other and you have to hold on to the things that I will give you. The stone that had sealed the tomb had been removed and it opened up the possibilities for all sorts of new things. The stone was a way to keep the body in. It was to put a lid on it, literally. Like the tomb, we all, we, I, you, all of us, we have things that we want to keep in. And there are good reasons to keep things in. You know, you go to the doctor's office and you're going to have a blood test drawn and the technologist puts on gloves to make sure that there are no contaminations. There are reasons for protection. We live in a world where there is violence and there is fear. Just this week with the bombings in Brussels, we saw an awful side of that. Over the last year, though, a thousand people around the world have been killed in similar sorts of attacks. In the Ivory Coast, in Turkey, in other places in Africa and Asia, and the United States, there have been these other attacks. We live in a world where we want to have our stones so that they will protect us. We want to have our families, our loved ones, ourselves, we want to have protection and security. Stones can be used for us to hide away, to bury those things that we don't want other people to see. We can hide our burdens from others. We can even hide them or attempt to hide them from God. We can shut people out with our stones, with our barriers. We can build bastions. We could erect fortresses. We can construct walls, trying to keep other people out. And yet, the gospel story is the stone was removed. Robert Frost penned the famous lines, good fences make good neighbors. And that is often used and cited as a reason to keep barriers between people. Good fences make good neighbors, yes. But the poet asked further, why do they make good neighbors? Isn't it where there are cows? But here, there are no cows. Before I built a wall, I'd ask to know what I was walling in or walling out and to whom I was like to give offense. At the tomb of Jesus, the stone is rolled away. The stone had been a way of securing the body in a small space locking it out of sight, out of mind, so it wouldn't smell as it decomposed, so it wouldn't be an agent of decomposition away from the world. But the stone was gone and the body was gone. The stone was not simply something to protect the world, 
but the stone was a doorway into a tomb. It was a doorway into another world. And the risen Lord came back through the doorway into this world. On that first Easter morning, Mary came to the tomb and the stone was gone. It wasn't there. The end had become a place for a new beginning. The stone that was removed became for Mary and for Peter and the disciple whom Jesus loved a new way of living, a new doorway, a new path. The stone being removed is for you and for me and for any who seek to follow Jesus a new doorway to life, to hope, to goodness. It's a new way of relating. The power of life is at work in the world. The stone had attempted to cover over, but it had been removed. Whatever brought you here today, may you find the stone in your life removed so that you may live life in Christ. Live life in Christ, fulfilling that commandment that He gave in John's Gospel. I give you a new commandment. Love one another. The stone is removed. Thanks be to God. Amen. Invite those who are able to please stand as we affirm our faith. We'll be using the Nicene Creed. And in your hymn book, it is on page 12. The Lord's Prayer is the top on that page. Nicene Creed is in the middle. Let us now say what we believe. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day He rose again according to the Scriptures and ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the Father, and He shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. And let us pray. Almighty, gracious, and loving God, it is Easter, and we pray for Easter joy. We pray for those who grieve on this happy day. Their grief is real, and we lift it up to your throne of grace. We pray for those who seek healing. We pray for protection from what steals our joy. Yes, we pray for Easter joy. By the victory of Christ, we pray for Easter hope. Gathered today are some who wrestle with doubts and yet seek to believe. We pray for those seeking hope, reaching for the light through a dark cloud. We pray for those who hope to reconcile differences with spouses, family members, or friends. Yes, we pray for Easter hope. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray for Easter vision. 
May we seek your purpose for our lives, even if it means trying something new, and may we follow it. May we discover your direction for mission, and may we pursue it. And may we join your will to challenge us to grow, and may we actively respond to that. Yes, we pray for Easter vision. And we pray these things in the name of our risen, victorious Savior, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And let us continue our worship as we present to God our tithes, our offerings, our gifts, and our very selves. giving God, we dedicate our tithes and our offerings and our gifts in the strong name of Jesus Christ to build His kingdom, to do His work. And may we recommit ourselves to follow more faithfully in this week ahead. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
May the stone, the tomb in your life be removed. May it open a way to pass through to new understandings, to new comprehensions, to new relationships of God's love and God's grace and God's power in the world and in your life. May it transform you so that you may partake in the wonderful transformation that God is at, has at work in the world. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit surround you. May it be with you every time you breathe in and every time you breathe out. May it accompany you with every step you take and every stride you make this day and always. Go in peace. Happy Easter.